get more. All right, Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 1, very familiar passage of Scripture, and it deals with, of course, alcohol, wine, and strong drink. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. I talked about this morning, the, the, the terrible problem we've got going on in America, and I, I'm sure it's across the whole world, but some of this, and I'm going to give you just a couple of highlights some that pertains to us here. Some of this people don't understand. Some of it they know, and some of it they do not know, and they're not familiar with it. Um, but there was a long, for a long time, a long time, independent Baptists, Southern Baptists, uh, the, the black Baptist churches, American Baptists, General Association of Regular Baptists, uh, up north and out west, we all stood on the same thing when it came to alcohol. We all stood uh, on the fact that it, that it should be total abstinence, um, some, there were some denominations that believed more in temperance, uh, Catholics, uh, Lutherans, uh, some Episcopalians, uh, and even some Methodists believed more of temperance, but, but uh, just about all Baptists, um, uh, the Church of God, the Assemblies of God, we, we all believed in total abstinence, and we, we taught that for a number of years. I, I'm not going to go back and read all that, but I read all the different statements by the Southern Baptist Convention, by the Consolidated American Baptist Convention, which is black churches. Um, firm on that, just firm on that. It was the 1960s, the same as apostasy, when apostasy, apostasy started moving into America. 1960s, when the neo-evangelicals started implementing this idea that social drinking could be accepted. They started inputting that, that, uh, there was, that God didn't frown upon drinking, he just frowned upon getting drunk. And they're the ones that, that really began instituting that idea. And it was in the 60s when they did that. In 1978, I, I read this quote by Richard Cabado, and he had just simply said, uh, dealing with the evangelicals, cocktails have become increasingly more difficult to refuse among evangelicals. He's talking about the evangelicals. And he said there, there had been a recent Gallup poll there about born-again Christians believing in a strict moral code. This was in the late 70s. And that was still true. We did have a very strict moral code. That would change within a decade, though. Everything would start changing. But he said even though we had a moral code, that strictness has been, quote-unquote, that strictness has been considerably modified during the last few years. And he's right. Uh, within a decade and a half, everything began to turn when we speak of religious things or spiritual things you know, pertaining to the church. Apostasy started setting in. We, we stopped trusting God by faith to supernaturally do a work in a man's soul. We started teaching this hyper-believism form of the gospel. We can get them, just get them to repeat a prayer. Don't worry about what their life looks like afterwards. Get them to repeat a prayer. they got a ticket into heaven. And that's unbiblical. Uh, we, we know from the scriptures that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. God does a supernatural work in the heart and the soul of that individual that truly trusts him by faith. If someone, We have evidence in the Bible. Jesus gave us the parable about the, 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 the seed and how it's sown on the different grounds. If someone claims they're saved, they heard the word, and they claim they receive it, but they don't take root. That's evident that they were not clear. They were not true, not true Christians. That's evident it didn't take root. They, they weren't born again. They got religious. They went so far just like Judas could kiss the very door of heaven and fall away. That's the word apostasy. It's, it's referencing the falling away from. You come right up to the point of believing. You understand, but you fall away from it. Well, they started that in the 60s, went through the 70s, the 80s, and many decades after that. And along with that, their views against sin became less and less and less and less. And you find today that the views against um, pornography, the, view, the views against um, uh, sexual relationships outside of marriage, the views against um, racial situations, uh, the views about work, uh, and the views about the church, all these things have changed. Well, along with that comes the view about alcohol. And now the, the view of alcohol has changed, been changing for a number of years, and it started way back then. Um, and now we've, we've got a mess. We've got a mess on our hands that's getting worse and worse. I had done a research. We don't know for sure. These schools are keeping a tight lip about this, but we know there's evidence. We have evidence now from many of the Christian universities and Christian colleges. Now, you do the Google yourself, you'll see the same thing I did. There have been many local reports from different news agencies reporting some of this, and then some of the schools have came out and made a statement, but we don't know the numbers. We're, we're getting parents and grandparents that are, that are pulling up in the driveways of many Christian universities and colleges, picking up their, their kids and their grandkids, and when they leave there, they drive straight to rehab because they've gotten addicted while they're in the Christian university and the college. They've gotten addicted. My niece, I told you this story this morning, my niece 
came home from Bob Jones. It's her first year at Bob Jones. And she came home one day and began talking to uh, the people she looked up to in the church there and asking them, I mean, seriously, going, I, it's not that I want to do it, but I want to know why, why is drinking wrong? Just tell me. And so she was getting that from Bob Jones, not from the faculty, not from the staff, but from the students. And the students were, were relying upon some of the faculty and some of the staff, and they were being led somewhat astray in this idea. And so they were submitting to her that we, when we leave out you know, on, our, on the weekend, we're on our own, there's nothing wrong with having to drink every now and then. And so they're starting to, that trend, even at Bob Jones, they're beginning to turn in that, twin, in that trend there. I'd already heard about it, Pensacola, uh, Crown College has had to dismiss students. Um, um, out in California, Paul Chapel, um, Lancaster, uh, out there at Lancaster Baptist Church out there in, in uh, what's the name of the school? I know that school. I can't think, I can't think, I won't say Lighthouse, that, that's not it. But anyhow, but there, there's been trends. It's, it's continuing. This is going along with the apostasy. It goes right along with the apostasy. All those verses I read this morning, I don't have time tonight, but we, we have scripture that teaches us out of 2 Timothy that a, the perilous times will come in the last days. There's going to be a, a, a falling away, apostasy, and it's referencing the church. The church is going to have that falling away. The world's always been falling away. There's nothing new with them. But the church is now falling away into apostasy. Um, and I gave you some examples this morning. Moody Bible Institute uh, in 2013 ended a 127-year ban against alcohol and tobacco use by its faculty and staff. They ended that in 2013. They no longer have that ban. 2003, Wheaton College, which is where A.W. Tozer, John Walverd, um, Billy Graham uh, went to school. They announced in 2003 that they changed its rules, allowing drinking and smoking and dancing among their students and their faculty members out there now. 2014, Dallas Theological Seminary, one of the most stringent, strong, traditional, fundamental Southern Baptist schools. Dallas Theological Seminary with David Jeremiah went to college. Hal Lindsey, J. Vernon McGee, Charles Caldwell Ryrie went to school there. Chuck Swindoll, um, they dropped its ban against alcohol, 2014. And then I mentioned just in 2016, they started a new ministry in Greenville, South Carolina called Hymns and Hops. You can Google it. Hymns and Hops. And Hops is, I don't, it's, it's a natural product. I don't know exactly what it is because I've never made beer and don't plan on making any. But Hops is used in the making of beer, alcohol. And that's what they do. They come together and they, they sing some gospel hymns and they drink their beer and their brews. Um, that one of their phrases, one of their testimony is, uh, there's nothing like worship at a brewery. Their, their motto is, sing loud and die happy. And their, their creed is it, that Hymns and Hops creates the space for families and people to celebrate the gospel through community, song, and alcoholic drink. Um, it, they're no longer hiding this. They're promoting this. And so you see, you see there's a trend of acceptance of, of alcohol among not just Southern Baptists, not just black Baptists, but independent Baptists and, and strong fundamentals. You're beginning to see some that are, that are giving into this. Um, and uh, it, it's sad. I think it's just a commentary of the day we're living in. It's promoted everywhere you go. I didn't realize it until I looked it up, but alcohol companies spend almost $2 billion a year in advertising. Uh, $2 billion a year in advertising. And a lot of that advertising is targeting young people now. And they're trying, and they're getting them. They're getting them. I mentioned to you all the, the statistics about the, about the young people. The median drinking age in America, if I were to ask this question, I bet every one of us would have got it wrong. The, the median drinking age, the age that, that kids start drinking, what age do you think? I, we'd be probably saying 15, less than 13. Less than 13 is the median drinking age. So some of them, less than that, they start drinking. 83% um, of the, the adults who drink had their first drink of alcohol before the age of 21. Four out of 10 young people who picked up alcohol, they picked it up before the 18 years of age. 90% um, of high school seniors now say they have drunk alcohol sometime in their lives by the time they're a senior in high school. All the, this is just astounding. Four million Americans under the age of 18 have been already flagged as alcoholics under the age of 18. And we're promoting this stuff. And we're pushing it. Well, it goes with the age of apostasy. It fits. And that was really what we preached on this morning. Tonight, I want to look at some, some scriptures specifically and try to deal with the scriptures on this. And, and uh, well, I, I won't be able to complete everything that I wanted to complete, but I think we'll get as far as the Lord would want us to get tonight. And, and we'll, we'll try to do our best. 
Uh, Proverbs chapter 20, and again in verse 1, wine is a mocker. The word mocker means to be in derision or to talk arrogantly. That's what it's, you make a mockery of yourself is what it's referring to. Wine will cause you to make a mockery of yourself. It makes you arrogant. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Strong drink is any intoxicant. It's just referring to an intoxicant. Something has been added to it to cause it to be an intoxicant. I, I dealt with it this morning, the difference between mixed wine, uh, strong drink, and, and wine. And I'll, I'll deal with it again in detail, but wine can be either the fermented version or the unfermented in the Bible. It, just, it, it is picturing at times uh, the alcoholic wine and at times just the fruit of the vine. It's picturing both. It uses the same word, just wine, one generic word. It doesn't change the wording. It's just you got to look at the context to see what it's referring to. Strong drink is just a drink that has been strengthened with alcohol. That's the picture. And it's somewhat different than what a lot of people kind of imagine, but it's any intoxicant. You have made a drink an intoxicant. You Even with, with liquor or with beer, for instance, with beer or, or with wine. We use wine as an example. To make a wine an intoxicant, you start with the juice, and then you add yeast to ferment it. So you're adding something, it's adding some ferment, cause fermentation process, which is going to turn it to an intoxicant. So it's really making it strengthen with the alcohol. That's why it's the picture of strong drink. Mixed wine is just something that's right opposite of strong drink. It's, it's watered down. They had that very common in Bible days. In fact, matter, the, the level of alcohol, and we know this, the level of alcohol in Bible days is nowhere near the alcohol content of today. They did not have that type of distillation process of alcohol until the 12th century A.D. They didn't come up with it. They had fermentation. That's how they made something alcoholic, fermentation. That's what they did back in Bible days. It wasn't until the 12th century that they dis learned this distillation process with alcohol, which would really get it down to the purest form of alcohol. That's what really affects people. They had nowhere, they had nowhere near the alcohol content that they have today. So all that was different back then as well. But wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Uh, the word raging means to be boisterous or roaring. It, it, again, makes them loud. You, you just think in your mind. If you've ever seen a drunk act out, you know what it's talking about. But this is the part that's interesting. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Deceived means to swerve as like a drunk would swerve or to be led astray can mean both. It can be led astray. And, and someone that is deceived can be led astray by the alcohol and thinking it's going to provide something pleasant to them and it ends up ruining them. And that's the picture there. Uh, whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You participate, you partake in this, you're not wise. Whether you say it's sin or not, in that point, it's beside the point. You're not wise if you're partaking in it. Why would you partake in something that could ruin you, that could wreck you? Why would you do that? I, I may Look, it may be a thrill for me to bungee jump, but if two out of every ten people that bungee jump drop to their death, I'm taking a risk. It's not worth the risk to me. Now, it might be to you, but it's not to me. The thrill isn't worth the risk. Why take the risk? You're not wise to take that risk. Even if you think you can sit there and admit a whole, I've been millions of people, thought they'd take that first drink. And that was the message this morning. It all started with a drink. One drink. One drink. Every drunk always starts with one drink. Every story in the Bible of people ruining their lives with alcohol started with one drink. It starts with one drink. If you never take the one drink, you cannot become a drunk. You can never have a problem with alcohol if you don't take the drink. It starts with just one. But there have been plenty of people that took the one drink that it ruined their life. They couldn't stop with the one. Continued and continued and continued. So whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. In other words, whosoever gets drunk is not wise. And wine and strong drink will make you drunk. So a wise man would not drink. Because where it could end up. You just won't do that. So how is wine and strong drink deceptive? Deceiving. How is that? It is deceiving by listening to people who say you can drink socially and not be harmed. There, that, it started out with people saying, well, you know, back in the 60s, you might could drink okay and not be harmed. You, you, I, could, I could see that. Now they're firmly saying, oh, it's clear, you can drink socially and not be harmed. They ignored all the thousands of people that have been harmed that, that just tried to drink socially, and they have been harmed. So that's the deception. By listening to people who say you can drink socially and not be harmed, you need to remember it all started with just one drink. You definitely can't be harmed if you don't have that one drink. 
but you certainly could be harmed if you have that one drink. Noah, Lot, Belshazzar, and thousands upon thousands of lifelong drunks who thought just one won't hurt were proved otherwise. So that's Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 1. Now look at Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. Chapter 23 is loaded with passages dealing with the drunkard and dealing with the drinking. And we're just going to read six verses here. Verse number 29 through verse number 35. But you could go previous to that. You could read about the drunkards and the gluttons. And verse number 20 and 21. That famous verse on be not among wine bibbers. Um, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. And drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. That's up there. But verse number 29. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Again, the mixed is, is diluted wine. It's diluted with water and spices sometimes. We, in our day, we might call liquor, mixed liquor, mixed drinks. We would call it's been diluted with something. We would call it that. Who in the world, who would want that? I mean, look at the description. Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Just seeking, just seeking the mixed wine can result in these things. I just wouldn't seek it at all. There's, there's no wisdom in that. Verse 31. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. This is a picture of fermentation. Verse 32, at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. That's the end. That's the end result of drinking. It's going to bite like a serpent and sting like an adder. There have been untold numbers that have been bitten and stung. And yet many of them just keep going back to it. They know they've been bitten and stung, but yet they keep going back to it. Verse 33, thine eyes shall behold strange women, thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea. You're going to drown in misery and in sin. That's all that alcohol can lead you to. That's it. You're going to drown in this. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. And this is why so many addicts seek to take their own lives. That They get hooked on the drugs. They get hooked on the alcohol. It wrecks their, their look, this is their description. They know they're full of woe. They know they're full of sorrow. They know they're full of contentions and babbling and wounded and redness of eyes, they're full of all that stuff. It's biting like a serpent, stinging like an adder. And the next morning they wake up, they do it again. That's an addict. You can't be addicted to alcohol if you don't take your first drink. It's an impossibility. And it's the same with any drug. Alcohol is just a liquid drug. Y'all say what you want to say, but alcohol is just a liquid drug. It's a liquid form of a drug. We just don't regulate it like we do everything else. But it's a liquid form of a drug. So um, you, you, you get the instructions here. This is indications. And I know, I know this is a lot of indications of those that have the overindulge and getting drunk and all that. I understand that. But the point of the matter is if you don't start the drinking to begin with, you can't ever get to the point of overindulging. That's the wisdom. That's where you are wise. Just don't start it to begin with. Don't even seek the mixed wine. Don't seek it. And you can't ever have a problem with it. Now, it's important to understand in the Bible that the word wine sometimes refers to the alcoholic wine and sometimes it refers simply to grape juice. You have to look at the context of the passage to determine which it is referring to. Genesis chapter 9, verse number 20, verse number 21. We know this story. You've got the story of Noah after the flood. Verse number 20, and Noah began to be a an husbandman and he planted a vineyard. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. And he drank of the wine. That's where he messed up at. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Cain, and saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. Shem and Japheth took a garment laid it upon, their, uh, upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were backward. They saw not their father's nakedness. 
And Noah woke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. So we know the story. We know that Noah here, and it's talking about the, he drank of the wine. Verse number 21, he drank of the wine. We know that wine is an intoxicant. That's alcoholic. It's the word wine. It's the Hebrew word for wine. But here, it clearly is referring to alcohol because you couldn't have got drunk if it was just juice. He could drink all the juice he wanted. He would never get drunk from just juice. All right. Then Isaiah chapter 16 and verse number 9. Isaiah 16, verse number 9, it's going to speak of the, the juice of grapes. Non-alcoholic, but it uses the same word. Isaiah chapter 16, verse number 9. Therefore, I will be well with the weeping of Jazer, the vine of Sibma. I will water thee with my tears, O Hezbon, and Elia. Uh, Eli, 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 I'm sorry, for the shouting for thy summer fruits and for thy harvest is fallen, and gladness is taken away, and joy out of the plentiful field. Um, and in the vineyards there shall be no singing, neither shall there be shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine in their presses. I have made their vintage shouting to cease. He's talking about the wine press where they would get in with their bare feet and they would tread out the grapes with their bare feet and press the grapes, the juice out of the grapes and they would have ports at the bottom which would go into buckets or go into jars in Old Testament times and they would go into those, those uh, made jars and they would press the juice out and it would run down into those jars. They would they'd press it with their feet. Those are the wine presses. So we know that's not fermented wine. We know that's not alcoholic. That's juice. It's coming right out of the grapes. That's juice. The traders shall tread out no wine in their presses. It's the same Hebrew word. The identical word is what we just read over in Genesis 9. So when you read the word wine, it's, and it's true also in the Old Testament, you read, or in the New Testament, when you read the word wine, it can be speaking about fruit of the vine, or it can be speaking about the, alcohol, the alcoholic kind. You have to read the context. We knew from Genesis 9 that Noah drank alcoholic wine. How did we know that? Because he got drunk. You can't get drunk from drinking grape juice. It's got to be the fermented kind. It's got to be alcoholic to get drunk. And we know here that it could have been alcoholic wine from the context because they just pressed it right out of the grapes from the wine presses. So you have to look at the context. Also something I want you to notice here in verse number, uh, let's see, verse number 10. And gladness is taken away, and joy out of the plentiful field. And in the vineyards there shall be no singing, neither shall there be shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine in their presses. There are passages in the scripture that talk that, that combine the word wine with gladness or joy, something of that. But gladness is a key word that seems to trip people up. They, a lot of people think if you've got wine and gladness in the same passage, it's always talking about alcoholic wine. Well, you've got wine and gladness in verse number 10, and it's clearly not talking about alcoholic wine. So every time you see the word gladness with wine, you cannot assume that it's referring to drinking alcoholic wine. There are people that make that error in their, in their understanding. They think, well, if it's making you glad and you got gladness and joy, well, it must be getting you tipsy. No, not here. And it's other places in the scripture as well. It's not, it, it, gladness and joy is not just associated with alcoholic wine. It can be associated with just, just wine, just fruit of the vine. Glad that God has given it to you. So you have to understand that. Now we have to look at the context of the passage to determine if it's speaking of the juice or of the alcoholic wine. This is how we know that Jesus did not turn the water into alcoholic wine in the gospel. He did not. I discussed with someone this morning that asked me that question. And I knew it was going to come up. And I didn't deal with it this morning because I knew I was going to deal with it tonight. Think about, the, think about what we know about Jesus turning the water into the wine. Think about the context. This was right after he begun his earthly ministry. First miracle from the hands of the Lord. Right after he begun his earthly ministry. And he's trying to present everything the Lord did. It was with purpose. He didn't just do something. Everything he did was with purpose. Everything he did was with purpose. And when he did this, he changed the wedding at Cana of Galilee. He, he turned the water into wine. It was with purpose. He's beginning his earthly ministry, and he's presenting a type there. The type is he's picturing, the, he's, he's, of course, the bridegroom, and he's picturing the marriage, both the marriage supper of the bride, which is the church, and he's also picturing the marriage supper of the wife, which is Israel. 
You understand the Lord's going to marry the church, the bride. He's going to marry the bride during the, during the tribulation here on earth. We're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is Christ marrying the bride in heaven. And then right before the beginning of the millennial, he's going to remarry his wife, Israel. They're currently divorced. They're pictured as being divorced in the Old Testament. He's going to remarry his, his wife. They're always pictured as the wife of God. He's going to remarry the wife of God, which is Israel, prior to the beginning of the, the millennium reign of Christ. Right prior to the millennial reign of Christ. Um, so he's, that's the picture. He's turned the water into wine. There is no way in this world that Jesus would turn that into alcoholic wine. In order for it to be alcoholic wine, in Bible days it had to ferment. And the only way it's going to ferment where it turns into alcoholic wine is if they add yeast to it. What is the word for yeast in the Bible? Leaven. They'd have to add leaven to it to turn it. And to add leaven to it, he's picturing sin at the marriage supper of the Lamb. He's picturing sin at the marriage of his wife Israel. There is no way in this world that there's going to be sin present. That God's going to expound this or express this at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're not going to see that. Jesus had just begun his earthly ministry there when he, when he has this turning the water into wine. The picture of that marriage of Cana is the Lord marrying his bride or his wife. That alcoholic wine is fermented by adding yeast, leaven. Leaven is always pictured, well, just about always, not, not, to, not in totality, but it's generally pictured as being sin. In that case, it is pictured as being sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 6. The Bible said, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. As ye are unleavened, you're saved, you're without sin. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, not the old leaven of sin, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Leaven pictures sin. Leaven pictures sin. Unleavened pictures being made sinless through the blood of Christ. And that's the picture we have there. So there's no way Jesus would have permitted sin at the presence of the marriage supper of the Lamb, and therefore he does not have alcoholic wine that he's presenting that he's turning in uh, from the water into wine. They, the individual this morning asked me this question. He said, okay, well then why does it say that the end wine at the end was better? Why did they say it was better than the beginning? Normally the first wine is better than what you give at the last, but in this case, the last wine was better than the first. He's still talking about juice. He's not talking about alcohol. Now think about it. Just think about it. If you think about it, you understand it. When they have these Jewish weddings, they're going for days. The, the ceremony. Normally, the wealthy people could go on for weeks. But they would go on for days. And the, bigger, the longer they go, the bigger the ceremony and the more wealthy the individual was. They would serve the best wine, the best juice, the best fruit of the vine at first because that's when they have the dignitaries. The dignitaries, the big names, they come, on, they come right at the wedding, the beginning of the wedding. They come right at the start of the feast. So they serve the best juices, the best fruit of the vine then. But as they go several days in this, in this feast, they start getting lower and lower. So what do they do? They water down the wine. That was not uncommon at all. That's where mixed wine, the phrase, comes from. They water down the wine. The juice is watered down. Both They can water down the alcoholic and the juice. In this case, it's picturing the juice. They're watering down the juice to make it go further. It was a disgrace to run out. That's why Jesus' mother came to him and said, they're going to run out. It's going to bring shame on them. It was a shame to run out. It was not a shame to water it down. What do you think? Why do you think they got all that water laying around? They got all this water just sitting there. Why is the water there? They're trying to water down the juice. Well, they didn't realize they're out of juice. They don't have any juice to water down. They've got plenty of water, but no juice to water down. When Jesus turns that water into wine, they drink it. It is perfect juice. Nobody's ever, ever squeezed juice like Jesus did. Jesus made that, turned that water into, into wine, in the fruit of the vine. And when they tasted that, they said, wow, this is some of the best juice I ever had. This is, this is wonderful grape juice. Normally, they put the best juice at the first and save the worst, the watered-down juice, at the end. But you save the best for last. That's what he's saying there. That's the entirety of the picture. It's not alcohol. It's not alcoholic wine. It's the fruit of the vine. He didn't call it fruit. He uses the word wine. 
in the New Testament, just like in the Old Testament, the wine can be interchangeable. It can be alcoholic and it can be non-alcoholic. In that case, the picture only works if it's non-alcoholic. It will not work if it's alcoholic. But it makes perfect sense. So at the end, he, Jesus, he literally made it juice, the best juice you ever had. And that's why they said the juice at the end was better than what you served at the beginning. That's why they said that. Now, the primary passage, I mentioned this this morning. I'm just going to skip over this real quick. Man, my time is running out. The primary passage of Scripture that I believe clearly establishes that the Bible-believing Christians should never participate in the consumption of alcoholic beverages is in Leviticus chapter 10, verse number 8 through 10. And I, I, I think it, it stands alone. I'm going to read the verses. I'm not going to comment much of it. I'm going to move on. But in Leviticus chapter 10, verse number 8, the Lord spake unto Aaron. As I mentioned this morning, this is where the two sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, had gotten drunk. They go in there to the tabernacle, and they put the incense in. They, they disobeyed God. They got drunk. They're not supposed to put that in the lips and go in the tabernacle. They got drunk, go in the tabernacle, and God's going to express this to Aaron here in a minute. And they go in there, and they, they, the Bible talks about strange fire. They offered up strange fire. And we're not sure exactly what all that is. But their first problem was they started drinking before they went in. They got drunk. And then God deals with Aaron. Verse number 8, the Lord said to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. God said, If you do, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to take your life. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. So God establishes the fact that this wine and strong drink is pictured as unholy and unclean. They're not to be picturing themselves as unholy and unclean and going into the tabernacle. They're not to do that. God said, if you do it, I'm going to kill you. As he killed Aaron's two sons here, as he took their life. So you're not to do that. Now that's clear. It, you can't be more clear than God calls it unholy and unclean. Now, there are some that say, well, wait a minute now, preacher. I, I mean, I see that. I understand what you're saying there. But um, they were the priest. And maybe God wasn't upset with just the fact of having wine and strong drink. But he's upset with them being a priest and drinking it. Maybe, maybe just saying the priest should not drink the strong strong wine in the in, or the wine in the strong room. Maybe that's the point. Well, okay. If you say that then, you're going to have to acknowledge the fact that as born again believers, you and I are already priests. We're not only priests, we're kings. I read that this morning, Revelation chapter 1 verse number 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness of the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Hath made us, past tense. The day God saved you, he made you, supernaturally, a priest and a king. Now, you don't have your office yet. But he made you a priest and king the day God saved you. You're a priest and king right now if you're born again. Right now, he reiterates that in Revelation chapter 5, verse number 8, 9, and 10. Um, I'm just going to read verse number 9 and 10. They sung a new song. This is the four, uh, four beasts and the 20 elders. They sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us under our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And, of course, they're magnifying the Lord in all this, honoring him in all this. Hath made us under our God kings and priests. So we're already kings and priests. We're made kings and priests. Not only that, but uh, as I read uh, back on Mother's Day, Proverbs chapter 31, we find out that, that both kings and priests are forbidden to drink alcohol. Proverbs chapter 31, verse number 4. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Now, we believe this is, here speaking, is the mother of Solomon. And Solomon, Lemuel, King Lemuel is just a name for Solomon. And his mother is instructing him, it don't, don't touch the wine, don't touch the strong drink. It is not for kings to do It will mess up your judgment. And if you've ever seen a drunk... You know his judgment's messed up. It will mess up your judgment. But I'm telling you, you don't have to be drunk for it to mess up your judgment. It can mess up your judgment. Just drinking 
can begin to mess with your judgment. We know this from how they have tested the DUI subject. We know this at certain stages of the drinking, long before anybody would say they're drunk, their judgment is already messed with. You don't have to be staggering drunk to have your judgment messed with. Ask any cop that pulls you over and arrests you for DUI. You don't have to be a staggering drunk. Most people that, that just barely pass that threshold of saying, saying they're legally drunk, most of them can walk a line. But their judgment's messed up, and they know this. They know their judgment's messed up long before they get to the staggering fall-down point, before many of us would say, well, they're drunk. Their judgment's messed up. John chapter 7, verse number 24, the Bible says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. We are commanded by God. As priests and kings, since we're saved by the grace of God, we are to perform righteous judgment. How are you going to do that if you're messing with your judgment? If you're partaking of alcohol, you're messing with your judgment. So Proverbs 21 says alcohol is deceptive and deceiving. Why would we want to do that? Why would we want to do that? There are over 75 negative references. I've got a list of them. That's some of the notes left at home. I wasn't going to read all 75 of them tonight, but, but I have the list. There are over 75 negative references to wine and strong drink in the Bible. Negative references. There are two most commonly claimed scriptural references that people that promote alcohol for Christians use. There are two. The first one is the water and the wine. I've already dealt with that. I've already dealt with it. That's, that's, if you think about it, it's a no-brainer. It makes sense. It's not alcohol. It doesn't even picture alcohol. You can't explain why Christ would use alcoholic wine in that situation. But I can explain to you why he used non-alcoholic wine. The picture is correct. But there's two. And that, listen, just like so many other issues, just like the Calvinists will trip over all the many verses on whosoever will to get hung up on two verses of Calvinism. Just like the Armenian will look at, it'll pass over so many verses on God perfecting us forever, saving us eternally. They'll trip up on one or two and say, well, you can lose your salvation. If you don't keep it, you only endure to the end. You can lose it. They skip it. Well, the folks that promote this many times will skip every verse that's negative about alcohol and drinking and God warning us. He warns us to stay away from this stuff. And yet, they'll go to these two verses and trip over them and say, why do you explain that? Now, the, the, the marriage at Cana Galilee, that, that's an easy one relatively to explain. The other one's more difficult. It's a difficult one to explain. I, I'm, out, I'm out of my time. I know you're going to shoot me. I, I don't have time to, to deal with it in detail. I'm going to read the verse to you. I'm going to give you a couple of comments to think on, and I'll have to come back. And, but there's a, there's a reason behind this. Um, there, there certainly is a reason behind this. We're going to look at that. But the, the two passages, uh, one, of course, is in the Gospels. You've got a couple of cases there. But Deuteronomy chapter 14 is what I'm referring to. Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verse number 22. And it goes through verse number 26. Verse number 26 is the key. It's the one that's difficult to explain. It's difficult for every preacher, especially if we preach against the partaking of these things. And even, even in warning, it's difficult because the way it reads and people don't commonly think it through. And that's the problem. A lot, of, a lot of us, we all are guilty of this. We don't think it all the way through. We look at it and say, it looks like it's saying that. And you're correct. But then look at the context and think it through, and sometimes it explains itself to us. Verse 22, Deuteronomy 14. Thou shalt truly tithe. This passage is about tithing, okay? The Jewish tithe. Not, not what preachers make up to be a, a church tithe. The Jewish tithe, okay? Thou shalt truly tithe in all the increase of thy seed, that the field bringeth forth year by year. The tithe under the Jew, under the law, was 10% of the increase. It involved crops. And livestock, it very rarely ever involved any money. It's crops and livestock. They were literally to take 10% of their increase of the crops, 10% of the increase of livestock. They were to take it to the place that God had preordained, which in this case was going to be Jerusalem. Verse 23, thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, uh, uh, in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn and, the, and of thy wine and of thy oil and the first things of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And if the way be too long for thee, in other words, it's too far to carry the animals and the crops and all that, and if the way be too long for thee so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, 
When the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then shalt thou turn it into money. You can sell it, exchange it for cash or for gold. And bind up the money in thine hand, and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. So you can sell the 10% of all this, get the money for it, and take that money to the place. In this case, it was most of the time it was Jerusalem. Take that money to the place that you might, that you might give it. Well, there's sometimes it was when it was shallow, the tabernacle. But you take it to that place, and you can give the money instead of the crops and of the animals. That's what he's talking about. Now, this is verse number, twi- uh, verse number 26. This is one that, that uh, people have difficulty with. Thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thou, thy soul lusteth after. Okay? Uh, I'm going to deal with that. I don't have time. That word lusteth, that's important. For whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink. Wine, or for strong drink. If he just used wine, we could say that's his use. He didn't just use wine. He used strong drink as well. We know what strong drink is. Or for whatsoever thy soul desireth, and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice thou in thine household. Now, that's verses in the Scripture. And this is what really the difficulty for some people. They say, well, what about that verse? Even if I didn't know what that verse said, even if I thought I couldn't guess it, there is no way I'm going to ignore 75 verses that seem to drive me away from alcohol and strong drink in wisdom just to grab a hold of one. Take it in its context. Remember, understand that passage in its context. We're talking about Old Testament times. There were certain rules that was going on then that don't go on today, that didn't go on in the New Testament church. Polygamy was one of those rules. Did God ever give them a, a, a permission for polygamy? No. Did they do it and God gave them some rules and pertaining to it because they were already doing it? Yeah, God actually gave them some rules pertaining to it. They were already doing it. Well, by the time we get to the New Testament church, God clearly says, one husband, one wife. You violate that, it's going to hurt. There's instructions there, detailed instructions, right? So there's some things that may be allowed, may be done, that, that certainly God may allow, but he, he's not going to promote that or say, this is my will. Um, when we see the passage, wine or strong drink, he's saying take some of that money because they were supposed to prepare for this feast of the, of the, of the uh, there's, there's first fruits involved in that, but it's the feast of the tithe, the harvest of the tithe. It's a celebratory time. They would normally go in there and take all the animals and all that stuff in there, and they would, they would eat off of that, and they'd enjoy it, and they'd have, they'd have a joyful time. But when they sell it, they go without it. Then he's saying you can take this money and buy the things in order to celebrate the feast of the harvest. You can buy those things when you get to that place. You don't have them, you sold your stuff, you're going to take it as a tithe, and you can buy those things and enjoy, because would, this would go on for a period of time, several days. And they would enjoy that in their fellowship. People look at the wine and the strong drink, and they say, that must be for partying. Now, number one, God never says they're supposed to drink it. He says, for wine or strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth, and thou shalt, what's the next word? Eat. Thou shalt eat. That's not drinking wine or strong drink. That's eating. There's a difference in eating and drinking. Now, some people try to say, well, he meant both. But he didn't say both. He's referring to the eating. So there's a possibility that the wine or strong drink is for another purpose, not for consumption. So they're going to be merry and have gladness, and they can do that with regular fruit juice and just other fellowship, other things. They don't have to have strong drink or wine to do that. To tie that joy at the end, or thou shalt rejoice, or tie that to just to alcohol is nonsense. We've already shown, seen the verse didn't do that. What we have to understand, and I don't have time to read these verses. I'm going to just give you the reference. I'll come back and read them later on. We have to understand that wine is strong, wine had strong drink had useful purposes in the Bible in Old Testament times. Many other than drinking. They were part of the drink offering. Numbers chapter 28, verse number 7. It was specific, God specifically identified that as part of the drink offering. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that. I just want to read that right quick. Numbers 28. Because I want you to hear that verse. Numbers 28, verse number 7. And the drink offering thereof shall be the fourth part of a hen. For the one lamb in the holy place shalt thou cause the strong wine. There is no, no doubt about what he's talking about here. Thou, thou shalt cause the strong wine to be poured unto the Lord for a drink offering. The, the point is this. You can, that, that strong, it's got leaven in it. 
destroy, it's alcoholic. God, they're going to pour it out unto the Lord. They are not going to pour it on the altar. It's not going to be applied to the altar. The only thing to be applied to the altar is pure blood of the Lamb, picturing the blood of Christ. You can't get to heaven through your works. That leaven pictures your works, your sinful works, and all of your works are sinful. You cannot make it to heaven through any of your sinful works. So it's a testimony of the God. We're going to accept the blood and reject the strong drink and pour it out. It's poured out, but unto the Lord. That's a picture. God, I can't, I can't get to heaven, not by works of righteousness, which I've done. I'm pouring them out. I can't get to heaven. I'm taking the blood that is applied to the mercy seat. See, that's the picture. That's the, that's the drink offering that's being poured out. So there's a picture. So it's used as a drink offering. It's also used as medicines. Proverbs chapter 31 and verse number 6. The Bible references over there. Um, I, I, I got I to end here, but I, I hate doing this. But it, it's, I've got I've to close. I'm over my time. But Proverbs chapter 31, verse number 6 said, Give strong drink. Again, that's another, we know what that is. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. They're dying. And wine unto those that be of a heavy heart. This is a medicine they're dealing with. Medicinal. There are scriptures in the Bible that talks about references strong drink in dealing with people that what we would call PTSD. They would be suffering from all the effects of this. And there's a reference there. We would call it PTSD. What, what do we do with people suffering PTSD now? We give them what? We give them meds sometimes. Strong drink, alcoholic beverages were used as a medicine. They're also used as, as, a, as a sin offering. We read the scriptures. We know that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul's in, instructing Timothy, he said, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake. I've heard every preacher in the world talk about that, just fruit juice. It doesn't make sense. He's dealing with a medical problem. It, it seems to me that he's talking about the alcoholic. Take, take the alcoholic for your medical problem. Now, it could be, I wouldn't argue it. I mean, he could be talking about fruit juice. I mean, maybe wine has some kind of miracle, something in, I mean, this, the juice has some, some kind of effect in itself. I've heard folks say that. It could help the stomach. Maybe that's what he was talking about. But it, I, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be anything unbiblical if he did say, take this for a medical problem. It's used, it's been used for medicines for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So that wouldn't, that wouldn't surprise me any either. And then it's used as antiseptics. It's got alcohol content. Um, it has been used as a means. Alcohol would be watered down greatly and they would give it to children. We can study this in history. They would give alcohol watered down greatly to children. The typical rule in Bible days was three to one. Three parts water, one part alcohol, one part wine. They would water it down. Why did they do that? Because water was full of bacteria. And in fact, the matter until you really get in the 19th century... We, couldn't, we didn't learn the lesson. We didn't know how to get bacteria out of water. People would die from drinking water that looked fine was polluted. They would die from it. In the early colonies here in America, they drank a lot of beer because it's safer to drink than water. Just about everybody back then drank beer. It was safer to drink than water. Why? They boiled it. They didn't know boiling it would kill the bacteria. They didn't know, really, until you start getting into the 1800s, late 1700s, they started figuring some of this stuff out. Boiling would, cause, would solve a lot of problems. They know that. These beers and these other products, alcoholic-type products, would go through that process of heat. It would kill the bacteria. You cannot assume, since he definitely did not say drink the wine in strong drink, he said eat something. You cannot assume that he's referring to consumption. And just when they see the word gladness or joy, rejoice, and they immediately say, oh, that's, that's getting tipsy. It's getting happy. You can't assume that because gladness and joy and rejoicing is used in passages that we clearly see fruit is being pressed out of the grape. Not talking about wine there. Not talking about alcoholic wine there. So when you, I, I don't, I'm sorry I run out of time. I'm way over, but. Um, it, I've tried to come back here and finish that and give you all the rest of the verses when I go find them at my house, but I left them there. But it is, it is interesting when you study that. We have enough scripture, though, to definitely tell us, if nothing else, you need to be real wary of this. Just stay away from it. Stay away from it. And then we have clear warnings. You are not wise for intermingling with this. But to sit there and take those past couple of passages, to me, the Cana of Galilee, that, that's a no-brainer. You can easily explain that. And Jesus, in fact, man, we know he couldn't have used alcoholic wine there. It wouldn't picture it right. But this passage in Numbers 14 has always been difficult. But I think you have to actually think about the, 
th that time period and realize there's more than one purpose and God never told them to drink it and be merry. That's the way people read that verse. God told them to get drunk and be merry. That is not what he said. You're adding stuff to that scripture. You're imagining things that he didn't say. Take it in context. He doesn't even use the word drink other than describing the offering. He says eat. So he's talking about the food part. And have that joy and that gladness. But, but the alcohol and the wine, the strong drink, very well, and I think it did, had a different purpose other than just consumption. Father, thank you, Lord, for the study tonight. Lord, I, I know I rushed it there at the end. Lord, it's important. I, I, God, it's in my heart. It's important we understand this. I think we're, we're facing a, a horrible problem, especially with our young people, God. As soon as the church gets, gets so full of apostasy and apathy, Lord, we start preaching it's okay to, to consume this liquid drug. We're going to be in a mess with our young people. They're already getting into a mess. It, it's going to just multiply the problem. Lord, help us, God. Help us, Lord, Father God, to be a true voice of, of biblical reason. Lord God, stand upon the word of God. Um, not, not use assumptions, but, Lord, use the truth, what you've taught us, and proclaim that truth and stand firm, Lord God, upon the truth. Thank you for those, Lord God, that are here tonight. Lord, bless those who weren't able to be with us, touch them in the body. Bless us this week. Bless the meetings that's going on, God, the Hope of Israel meetings, the other meetings. Bless those meetings. Bless those preachers, those singers. Encourage our hearts, God. Help us, we pray now, Father, be a witness for thee. And thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. You're dismissed tonight. I'm sorry I went over.